If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Bob, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, when I was about uh, 10, I started talking to my uncle, who was a World War II vet. Um, he was a Corsair crew chief during most of the war. He was with uh, Claire Chenault and the Flying Tigers before the war over in uh, China. And um, he uh, talked to me a lot about airplanes, specifically the Corsair and the P-40. He yes. loved the Corsair. I, I, I love the Corsair, too. What a beautiful airplane. Um, but he, he was the one that really started me down that road. And my parents encouraged me. M most of my male relatives had been in the military. My dad was Army. My brother uh, is a Marine. My uncle was a Marine. I, I was the black sheep who went to the Air Force. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, didn't, I didn't know really exactly what I wanted to do flying-wise, but I knew I, I wanted to be in, in the industry. So I started to you know think about flying careers and uh, started building plastic models and, you know, researching them and reading a lot about airplanes in general um, and just kind of fell in love with the with the whole field, truthfully. Um, and so I started really looking into it. And as I became a teenager, I uh, uh, started going to uh, air shows when they'd come to town and go see in the airplanes um, and uh, met a couple of uh, Vietnam era guys, uh, F-105 pilots uh, from the Virginia Air Guard. They were really inspirational to me uh, and uh, kind of really uh, set me on the track to wanting to go into the Air Force and, and be an Air Force pilot. And so that's kind of what I pursued from a pretty young age and realized that's what I needed to do and kept my grades up and went to college and went through the RTC program to get my commission in the Air Force. Yeah, so what year did you actually join the U.S. Air Force? Um, I was an RTC graduate in the class of 86 from my school with uh, my bachelor degree, and I um, got orders to active duty in January of 87, and I was sent to Williams Air Force Base, which is now closed. It's still actually open as a civilian field, but uh, mm -hmm. it's no longer a training base. It was the biggest training base in the world at the time. Oh, okay. And uh, went out there to Willie in um, in early 1987, and uh, for, for the year of my undergraduate pilot training, UPT. So, can you talk us through some of your basic flying training on the aircraft you started, uh, you know, training on? Sure. Um, to maximize my ability to get a pilot slot in RTC, which they were very limited, very very rare um, at the time. I uh, had started taking flying lessons on my own um, in, oh, let's see, 1978, which when I would have been 14, and I just kind of paid as I went, got my private pilot's license either right at the end of high school or maybe while I was just finishing high school, um, and started my instrument training, had about 200 hours in light planes, mostly Pipers of various sorts, Piper Warriors, Piper Cherokees. And then when I went to the Air Force, uh, since I had my private pilot's license, I didn't have to do any of the screening in the T-41, which was yeah. Cessna 172. So I went straight to the T-37. Uh, we, we went into a month of academics um, and then straight into the T-37, which was a little twin-engine jet trainer. Um, a great airplane, uh, very forgiving, but a very, very effective trainer. Uh, and then we went to the T-38, and we did uh, like five months in T-37, six months in the T-38. And when I finished, I had a pair of Air Force pilot wings. Amazing. And what, were the, what was it like to fly the T-37 and T-38? That must have been incredible. Well, it was great for, I mean, I was 22. It's like completely know, yeah. paying me to fly jet airplanes. It was just crazy. <laughs> um, T-37 was, uh, since I had the civilian time, it was very 
easy for me to learn and fly. I did, I did extremely well in the T-37. It was a very forgiving airplane. Um, it was great at uh, aerobatics. It was great as a spin trainer. Um, we did a lot of spins and spin prevents every sortie. Uh, wasn't a great instrument trainer. It had very antiquated instrumentation, okay. but it was. Uh, but you really had to think about where you were. So your situational awareness was very good. So in that regard, it was good. I really liked flying the T-37. I went to the T-38, and it's kind of the great equalizer. Uh, it was, if you even had a lot of civilian time or not, it just really was, No, everybody was basically equal because no, none of us had pointy jet time at the time. And um, it was very fast. It liked to go fast. It uh, was very happy in formation. It was not happy when it was slow. Um, it required a lot of planning ahead um because of the speeds involved that you definitely had to think ahead of the airplane it was in the, so in that regard it was a great trainer i think that anybody that came out of that airplane um was well prepared to go to their next aircraft uh whether it be an f-16 or a c5 i mean it was it was a it was a really fun airplane to fly i really enjoyed it, it was, i had no complaints i'm really glad i got to do that before they went to the specialized upt where after t-37s you could go to you know, the T1, which is basically a business jet or or the T38, but you couldn't do both. So I was I was grateful I got to go through the T38 side of the house. So going through your training, did you know which aircraft you wanted to go on to on the, you know, the frontline squadrons? You know, it's an interesting question. The Air Force, of course, the U.S. Air Force is a big organization, it was way bigger than even um, a, a ridiculous number of choices. And you know, I I knew that eventually I wanted to become an airline pilot. I, I knew that I wanted to do that. But I thought at the time I would probably do 20 years in the Air Force, retire, and then go to the airlines. That was my plan. Uh, but it didn't work out that way, as it turns out. But uh, that's what I kind of was thinking. And I didn't know whether I wanted to go to be a big airplane pilot right off the bat or go fly tactical stuff Um you know, kind of, as I was inspired to do in my youth by talking to my uncle, talking to the 105 guys and et cetera. Um, and so I, I didn't I didn't really know which way I wanted to go. And as I got closer and closer to graduation, it kind of became obvious that I really liked the cross country flying, the nav, the just being in different places. Um, and so I, I decided to kind of more focus on heavy, wanting a heavy and my, you could put down on your dream sheet, they call it, your top 30 choices of aircraft. 30? And, um, <laughs> 30, yeah. I remember wow. that number. There was 30, and it was like, by the time you're down at like number 27, you're like, <laughs> I, I don't even know what a WC-135 yeah. is, but sure, I'll <laughs> say I'll take that. But my top three were KC-10, C9, and T-43, and T-43 is a 737. So you can tell it's a DC-10, a DC-10, a DC-9, and a 737. So it's pretty clear what I wanted to do uh, ultimately, but I don't know, I can't remember, I don't think at the time the Air Force was giving out KC-10s to uh, undergraduate pilot training graduates. I think that those were kind of reserved for guys that had been in the KC-135, the tanker community for a while, because it was really new at the time, mm -hmm. and it was kind of a reward, you know, go fly the nice big new airplane. So there weren't any KC-10s that came down, and so I got a C-9, which uh, there's two of us in my class that got the C-9. I was thrilled with it, and as it turns out, the C-9 was a way better gig than those other two airplanes ever would have been, uh, because when we showed up, I went to uh, school on the C-9 in what would have been February of uh, 88, and um, they were in a, the midst of a big airline hiring boom in the nation. So all of the senior captains and the majors and guys that have been flying for their six-year commitment, um, they, were, they were getting out and they were going to the airlines. Uh, and they needed us brand new co-pilots that just came out of pilot training to fly as much as we could, as wow. fast as we could, because they needed us to upgrade to aircraft commander and instructor just because they were running out of guys that were experienced. So the first couple of years I was there, I flew right at 1,000 block hours a year um, in the airplane because they were just pushing us to fly as much as we could. And that was great because I wanted to fly. 
I enjoyed it. It was a great airplane. The airplanes were incredibly well maintained. We flew a lot of legs a day. Typically, we'd fly eight legs a day, so a lot of takeoffs and landings. The airlines loved that eventually when I wanted to go get hired by the airlines because we had a lot of uh, flying in really bad weather, a lot of flying to mm. civilian fields and small fields, uncontrolled fields um, and whatnot. So a lot, of, a lot of different experiences in that airplane. Um, so I really enjoyed that flying, and it was, it was a really good experience. Only issue with the C-9 was the commanders of the units um, were sometimes a little bit aggressive about wanting to schedule sorties, which is a flight. And, um, and when you're the commander of a, a C-130 or a C-141 wing, you've got 30, 40, 50 airplanes that you can get your numbers up. Well, we had 11 airplanes uh, total in the States. And so to get their number of sorties, they wanted us to fly eight legs a day every day. Wow. And man, that sounds like a lot. And I would not want to do it again now in the airlines. But <laughs> the thing was, it really wasn't that bad because we always kept the airplane. We always kept the crew. And we typically would plan on refueling like twice a day. And we always had our own flight mechanic with us that would do refueling and stuff like that. So it really was a lot of approach work, a lot of in and out of airports, lots and lots of landings, um, but just outstanding experience if you wanted to be an airline pilot. So I, I love the C9. So yeah, we're gonna backtrack a, a bit here, Bob. But when did you get that call where you were like, and were like, right, you're going to C9s. How did that feel? It was great. You know, we in the Air Force, they do at the end of, uh, when, when you, about a month prior to, graduation so you're almost done with the program you have a few right. flights left they have something called an assignment night and it's been done differently over the years but um basically you and the way we did it it was it was like a big fun game it was a fun and games kind of night it was a big party all the instructors all the students from the class we had about i think there was 31 of us graduated and our spouses or wives, girlfriends, whatever, were, were invited to the O Club. And they had this big wheel, like a game show wheel, set up. And you'd spin the wheel. Of course, there's a guy back there directing it. And it would, you know, you'd spin it. It would tell you what command you were going to first. Like, are you going tactical air command, TAC, or MAC, military air command, or SAC? Or there, I think there was Alaska Air Command and a couple other random ones there. And, uh, you know, you would spin it and then it would go, in our case, military airlift command. So it's like, well, I know I'm going to get something that starts with a C. And then uh, and then it would show a picture of what you're going and your base. And I really wanted a C9. My degree in college, my mom was a nurse. My degree in college was in biology. I was a pre-med major because if I didn't get through pilot training, needed a fallback. And the Air Force was sending you to medical school. So that was my kind of alternate plan. But... Uh, I really wanted the C9, and one of my classmates, uh, they did it alphabetically, as I recall, went up, spun, got the, got the C9, and I was like, oh, because it was such a rare airplane, there was no way a second one was coming down. And then I go up, and it spins, and it's Mac, and I went, oh, okay. And then it was a C9, Scott Air Force Base, and I couldn't believe that there was two of them in one drop because it was wow. such a rare airplane. Yeah. It was very desirable. It was very hard to get. And so it was great. We, I had a built-in built -in buddy from pilot training that I went through C9 school with, which was awesome. And so uh, we, we showed up at school, and we were super motivated, flew a lot, um, and did real well. We were, um, like I said, they were flying us like crazy so we could get the experience to upgrade as fast as possible. And I upgraded to uh, Aircraft Commander, um, as a second lieutenant, so after less than a year in the C-9, well, I don't remember how many hours I had, probably eight or 900 in the airplane at the time. Wow. And, then, um, and then I upgraded to instructor as a first lieutenant, which was probably about a year, maybe later. So, because they, they were really pushing guys through. And as a comparison, if I had gotten that KC-10, those guys are stuck as co-pilots. They didn't even get to upgrade because they're flying so little mm. for three, four, five years. They were flying wow. 200 hours a year, 300 hours a year. So I was extremely fortunate to get to upgrade so fast and collect hours and, you know, go fly as much as I wanted. And later I became the 
my last duty post was chief of IP flight, which is basically the chief instructor for the squadron. So my additional duty was to go fly some more. So I, I just flew all the time and it was, a, it was a great gig. I really enjoyed it. So let's talk about the C9. So what was the role of the aircraft? And I think it was based on, uh, is it the MD-80 or is that, is um, that correct? Yeah, it's close. Uh, it's based on a DC-9. It's, it is, in DC fact, 9. it has the data plate. It says it's a DC-9-32F, which is freighter because it has the big door on the side. Um, but it was a modified DC-9 uh, bought by the Air Force for air medical evacuation. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, there were some differences from the civilian DC-9, but they were pretty trivial. We had a, we had a TAC-AN. The airplanes in Germany and Japan had an INS or two. Um, the ones in the States didn't have any inertial nav or INS. Um, it, it had a uh, cargo door, which opened up, and then a ramp would fold out so you could bring people in litters, you know, so stretchers, on. And it had, um, I think, 44... Um, seats max plus four stretcher positions, or they could reconfigure it really quickly to do up to 44 stretcher positions, depending on what patient load you're flying around. And we carried typically three uh, med techs with us, which were like medical assistants, and two mm -hmm. flight nurses. Occasionally, we'd carry a doctor if there's somebody high risk on board, like uh, someone who is having a premature labor issue or a burn yeah. case, something like that. Um, and uh, they, they could reconfigure the airplane at any of these stops. You know, you'd go through the day, and they might take some stretcher positions off and put the seats back in because we carried all this stuff in the belly of the airplane, and they were great. I mean, they we'd do 20-minute turns all day long, and they were awesome at it. So um, we did all this air medical evacuation. We flew to all the military fields in the U.S. with... Uh, 4,500 or more feet of runway. Um, we flew to a lot of civilian fields, basically anywhere that had a VA hospital. Like we go into Philadelphia International or LA International or all these other places that a typical military airplane would never show up at. So we were yeah. kind of um, almost doing the airline thing even before we were in the airlines. Um, but we got a lot of it, a broad experience. You know, you'd go to an uncontrolled field in the middle of Kansas at night and, you know, and do a circle of the land approach to minimums, which you, you would never do today. Uh, you know, and then you'd go to LAX and you would do oh, eight legs a day, pretty much every day with very rare exceptions of like you had some really long transcon legs and you might not be able to squeeze eight in in your duty day. But, um, yeah, flew, flew a ton uh, carried a lot of sick people, a lot of injured people, um, DOD, uh, mostly soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, and their families, um, dependents. Um, we do a lot of, uh, you know, out, uh, global outreach. You know, somebody has, a, you know, a stove explodes in the middle of North Dakota or something, and there's no other way to get them to a burn unit. We'd, we'd take non-military people sometimes as well. A lot of uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. It was super rewarding for somebody who liked medicine. I, I you know, that's that's one of the, the justifications I use to say why I should get a C9. It's like, well, I was pre med and my mom was a nurse and I really like medicine stuff. And uh, so I, I I really enjoyed that we were kind of doing our actual mission every day. You know, most most of the Air Force can't say that. You know, or a lot of the Air Force can't say that. You're, we're normally not at war. We're not actually dropping live bombs on, on targets every day. But, uh, you know, we were carrying sick people and injured people around all the time. And it was super rewarding to get called out in the middle of the night, go pick up somebody who was very, very ill or very, very injured, take them down to the burn ward in San Antonio or, or whatnot. And they made it. That was, that was awesome. It was just yeah. a great gig. I loved, I loved that part of it. And uh, the people I worked with, the uh, med techs, the nurses, they were all awesome. They were very good at their job. Um, they knew how to keep the operation moving. And it was an extremely positive experience, I'll put it that way. I think it's the best, it was the best assignment I could have gotten out of UPT, for sure. And as a pilot, did you ever get involved, you know, in the back with, you know, the, me uh, the meds and stuff like that? Or were yeah, you just I basically mean, the pilot? Um, 
you were the pilot first and foremost, of course, but, um, you know, typically on a quick turn, uh, you know, as the aircraft commander or instructor, who, if you were a pilot in command, you'd run into base ops, you'd check the weather. This was long before apps or anything. You'd check the weather, you'd get a good weather briefing, make sure you knew where you were going next and you'd make sure you had the, the fuel to do it and quick, because uh, we filed our flight plans all once in the morning. So it was like eight stops on the single flight plan. So it just stayed open all day. Really didn't have to do that. It just had to pick up our clearance. Um, and then you'd come back out and just see what needed to be done. The airplane was super easy to pre-flight. And um, normally the co-pilot would have that done, you know, with the flight mechanic. If they were getting fuel, they'd have that done by the time you step back out. And, you know, 10 minutes later, you were back at the airplane. And if something oh. needed to be done, you'd just get it done. And it's like, I've helped carry, you know, people on and off the airplane, help secure them, um, you know, if somebody needed a hand, whoever was there, whether you're the aircraft commander, or just, you know, somebody that was standing there that was not doing anything else would just help. And, you know, the nurses were very in charge of the patients and that was, that was fine. It's like, I was in charge of the whole thing, but you know, when it was came to patient care, we defer to their judgment. And if they thought, yeah, we needed to go do something else or have another plan or maybe divert to someplace else, we we do that, and we we uh, it really worked very very well. It was a very efficient team. And did obviously like you know the pilots uh, trained, but uh, did the crew in the back, you know, the nurses, the doctors, whatever, did they have to get like up to speed on being air crew, or was it just like get on with it? They did um, go through a school. It was a pretty short school because they're they're primarily nurses, doctors. The doctors didn't necessarily have spe specific training. Like if you had a premature labor going on, the OBGYN that was with the, the mom wouldn't have specific training. But if it was something where uh, a flight surgeon was required because, you know, there's you know, you're obviously operating at lower uh, cabin pressure than sea level. If it was something like that where it might affect the patient, the flight surgeons were trained um, in, you know, specifically in, in the air crew operations. Certainly the uh, techs in the back, um, they were trained and they were extremely proficient in, mm -hmm. you know, how to evacuate the airplane, uh, how to get the people on and off, how to, you know, reconfigure from stretchers to uh, seats and whatnot, and uh, they they were awesome at that. Uh, and the um, and the we had a we always flew with a flight mechanic. Uh, flight mechanic oh, was an enlisted guy. He was essentially a crew chief. So if you've seen crew chiefs, yeah, he was our crew chief, but he flew with us, and he was invaluable um, because he would be the one that fueled us during the day. He would assist the uh, techs with reconfiguring the airplane um and as needed and he would uh kind of be the guy that was the problem solver it's like if we we had a flyaway kit so we had like a main gear tire a set of brakes uh you know oil everything like that he'd be the guy that would be out there checking the oil before you know an hour before we showed up at the airplane he'd be out of the airplane every morning but wow. you know taking taking the inlet covers off you know making sure the airplane's good doing his walk around making sure nothing to be needed to be done i don't think I, I don't think I ever scrubbed a mission once for the airplane not being ready. Wow. I mean, we had a couple times when some stuff broke in route, but uh, I, I don't ever recall because you know if somebody's sick or dying, they they want the airplane to go. They don't want it to be like, oh yeah, it needs oil. You know, they they want it ready, and and they were they were awesome guys, and it was yeah. really considered an, an honor for them to be a part of a flying crew you know uh, mm -hmm. it was it was a step up from being a crew chief on the ground and that's not knocking crew chiefs at all it was just it was considered a a good deal to go and get around get to go fly with uh, the crews and they took it really seriously um they'd fly up in the jump seat with us in the cockpit and they would like get our atis you know they'd get the information weather information copy it down hand it up to us and so they were kind of like a almost a flight engineer en route. They knew the systems of the airplane great. So if you had something break, you'd go, okay, well, this is what the book says. What do you think? And they sometimes have input. And if you needed more, you could always call on, you know, call the command post and get a maintenance advisor or supervisor. But normally the mechanics on the spot, they were like, oh yeah, this is that, this is where, this is where this is going. And, you know, 
they were just superb at their job. And did you work with, uh, you mentioned like all the services, but like, yes, like you kind of mentioned, but if someone called you up and said like, there's a, you know, there's a, a disaster over here, like the send the C9, was that, would that happen with you and your yeah. crews? Oh yeah. Um, the, uh, the, they would, we didn't do the flight planning ourselves as the crew. Now, right. some of us did later get into that as an additional duty and do flight planning for the crews the next day. But um, typically it would work where the C9 was an asset, it was a military asset available to different agencies. Right. And uh, the agencies would, would uh, call up Mac, uh, call up the command post of Mac and go, we have 20 injured people and we need to evacuate them. They have this kind of injury. They have blast injuries or burns or, or whatnot. And you would, uh, and they would just go, yep, we'll give you a C9 and we'll send it out and it'll be here at this time. Mm. And um, we had all these trips that were going constantly across the, the, uh, the states and they, they might reroute you to pick up something different. They might change your itinerary slightly. Or we always had at least one and sometimes two alert aircraft that were basically, you had a crew that was on 24 hour standby on a pager and right. they, they would just, they just call you and you had an hour, I think it was to get to the airport wow. and be gone. And so they'd call you at three in the morning and you'd drive to the base and you'd go fly. And it, you didn't know what it would be. Normally, if they called out an alert, somebody was really hurting. It would be like, mm -hmm. I remember one was uh, a, a a military member and his dependent wife had tried to light a gas stove that had gone out in um, North Dakota in, in, in at night, and the stove blew up on them. And so they called me and mm -hmm. my crew up, and uh, we went, we picked them up in North Dakota, we took them down to Kelly Air Force Base, which is in San Antonio, and that's the home of the Air Force Burn Unit. I took them down to the Burn Unit, um, you know, and they were there, I don't know, four hours, five hours after they got hurt, which was great. And, um, of course, they had the nurses taking care of them and the IV, IVs going and everything in the back of the airplane. So they, they got, I think, the most up-to-date, urgent care they possibly could have gotten. And you know, that was an extremely rewarding thing to be part of, you know. I, lo I loved that. That was a great job. Absolutely. And uh, we'll get into a few more stories here, but let's talk about the C9 and uh, yeah. how did it actually fly? And maybe you can share some of the strengths and weaknesses of the aircraft. Sure. Um, well, it, like I said, it's a DC-9 Series 30, which is... Um, our max takeoff weight was 108,000 pounds. That's a little heavier than a standard civilian DC-9 would be. Um, it uh, we had instead of four or instead of three, we had five fuel tanks. So it was almost a transcontinental airplane. As far as flying the airplane for an initial airliner type, because it was a DC-9, the FAA gave me a DC-9 type rating, and you know uh, for for flying it, it's just mm -hmm. a DC-9. Uh, it is a very um, easy to fly airplane. It is largely analog and mechanical. There's nothing digital at all about it. Uh, it um, there's they they say the say that the saying is that DC stands for direct cable because there's all <laughs> sorts of cables. Everything you move in the cockpit makes a cable go to the back of the airplane and do something. <laughs> so the great thing about that was, although it did have hydraulics. You could fly the airplane just absolutely fine with no hydraulics whatsoever. If you lost oh, it all, okay. you, you, it flew just great. It was not a problem. Um, the uh, ailerons were always uh, unpowered. The spoilers did require hydraulics, but you know it's a pretty heavy airplane in roll. It's pretty uh, sprightly in pitch, and the rudder is extremely effective. It's very very easy to fly with an engine out or uh, you know in any kind of uh, crosswind. It's uh, it's cake to fly. It um, is a very reliable airplane, and I, I give the credit to the the Douglas team for mm. making it as hardy as it could be. It's a very strong airplane. I had no reservations in taking it into 
you know, a sub 5,000 foot long runway, uh, you know, it was, it was strong, had good brakes, uh, and would stop on a dime. And the, um, airplane was, it was modestly slow on final approach. So it was easy to put it where you wanted on the runway, which was, right. um, it wasn't, exceedingly fast it was a, a 0.84 mach uh is where it topped out at and we would cruise as high as 0.82 above 0.80 it would burn a insane amount of fuel so it started to really eat into your range if you did that but if you're going to someplace that's relatively close and you need to get people there it's good that's it's going to be as fast as you can go um, super stable on instrument approaches. We did a lot of instrument approaches. Um, very um, easy to trim and let you know take your hands off, and it would keep going essentially where you wanted it to go. Um, weaknesses: it could be um, if if it was really maxed out. We we had a 108,000 pound gross takeoff weight, which is a little bit more than a typical DC nine would have if it was a hot airport or high elevation it was a runway hog of course all airplanes become that way mm. but uh like if we we went to denver a lot in denver in the summer we would do um a, a flap zero takeoff they call it uh, we could do uh flaps five or 15 15 would be the norm uh five would be um another an alternative flap zero is just the leading edge slats extended and no trailing edge flaps. And that was a legal configuration in the DC-9. The trade-off is it gave you good second stage climb performance, so you could climb away well, but it would eat up 9,000 feet of runway easily. Oh, and uh, yeah. so it, it, you, would, you would need a lot of runway um, in the summertime if you were very, very heavy. Um, which is typical of other airplanes as well, but it was pretty pronounced on that airplane because it was never really designed to do that. Um, it was, uh, it really didn't have any particular vices. Some of the guys that came out of other airplanes thought that it was heavy in roll. And that's because, like I told you, the ailerons are actually connected via cable to the yoke. And uh, they're actually connected to tabs, which drive the ailerons, but that's esoteric. But the um, airplane is pretty heavy. It requires pretty large control inputs compared to some airplanes that are all hydraulically boosted controls, like the 737, which is uh, much touchier and res more responsive. Um, but it, it was just a matter of getting getting used to it. It just required more control throw. The uh, advantage, of course, is if you did lose all your hydraulics, it still flew just fine, which was awesome. So I, I really have nothing but praise for the DC-9. It was uh, for the for being built in the 60s. I think it flew first flew in 65. Um, it was, was impressive. A, a state of the art airplane for the 60s. Uh, it was uh, our oldest airplanes were 67 models and our newest ones were 72, I think. And the three um, that we got in 1967, they um, were the three that you sometimes will see in films um, from when the POWs came back from Vietnam. The POWs came out of Vietnam in a C-141, and then they were taken to a U.S. base, and then they were put on C-9s to disperse. So a lot of times you'll see them getting off the C-9s, and those were the... Um, the C9s, the 67 build C9s that you, you'll see in those films. And there's one of them still in the museum, it's, it's got, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm.